Hello guys, welcome back to 2021. Hope you guys all had an amazing, fantastic break and hope you guys are all well and safe. Now lockdown 3.0 in the UK. Tonight, Middlesex University Product Design, Product Design Engineering and Design Engineering are really excited to host our ninth talk in our annual guest lecture series. This runs weekly throughout the academic year on Thursday evenings, bringing together a vibrant mix of speakers from across the spectrum of design and engineering. A mix of leading practitioners, opinion leaders, radical thinkers, and emerging talents to inspire and support professional development for both our students and staff. Tonight, we're excited to host Yan Smeshkal. He's joining us from China, a founder and co-founder of multiple startups and companies, including Your China Guy and Co. He's also the founder of The Dinner, an exclusive networking concept which brings together world-class entrepreneurs and an ecosystem of builders, shapers, and makers from around the world to learn more about the Chinese and international business environments. He's also the co-founder of the D-Network, a global entrepreneur and investment network which includes regular podcast interviews with the next generation of entrepreneurs and investors who have a billion dollar experience or the potential of such. I've shared the links to Yan's D-Network and the previous podcast via email alongside on the notion.so uh, channel. So feel free to you know, check those out on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, and other popular channels. Yan was featured on the LinkedIn Power Profiles list in 2018. He's one of the most viewed and engaged members of LinkedIn China. Super connector, bringing people together, joining the dots. So details of this talk and Yan was sent to your emails ahead of the talk, including links to social media pages, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Yan's website as well. So definitely feel free to connect with Yan online. And without any further ado, Yan Smeshkal with the talk title, Moving to China and Becoming a Local Super Connector. So Yan, over to you, it's all yours, Yan Smeshkal. Okay, I see it. Amazing. I see it, perfect. Yan, uh, thanks for joining us all the way from China today. So cool. It's, it's oh. great to have you here. Um, and steaming through uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the overview of this particular guest lecture. And what we'll do is we'll um, have a conversation and a dialogue, you know, touching on your educational journey, your experiences in China during and post graduation as well. And hopefully uh, yeah. you'll embed and intertwine advice and key learnings throughout the discussion for students with some takeaway advices at the end as well. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, who are you and um, what is your educational background? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I'm always very happy to go back and engage with students because, you know, back then, even at the university, I've always been very active in different associations, hosting different events. And it's always glad to have somebody with some sort of experience, unique experience to come and kind of share their story, you know, so I'm always very happy to, to do that whenever people are interested in what I do, you know, so, so thank you so much for that. And uh, so, yeah, you know, I come from Czech Republic. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a very small town and then I moved to Prague and I actually attended uh, university there. And, you know, it's actually, you know, my kind of educational story or journey is very interesting because it was never really planned thoroughly. You know, it was kind of more serendipitous. And so, uh, you know, I studied economics and finance at the university. Then uh, I kind of started studying banking at my you know master's degree or for my master's degree and then actually in the process of that i moved to china and then i switched from one university to another and i finished kind of international trade management type of degree in china actually and uh you know as i said you know it wasn't really planned because you know the the opportunity to go and to come to china and uh, basically, you know, even switch my universities or even actually establish later on my company here that really happened serendipitously. You know, it was it was basically coming from that angle that I was always pretty active at the university. I was always eager to learn, attend different events, build communities. And uh, basically, you know, at some point, one day I still remember, you know, I read an article about a Chinese brand called Xiaomi. And uh, basically, you know, we decided to bring this brand to Czech Republic and Slovakia, even though we had no idea what we were doing back then. You know, we didn't know anything about, 
you know, international trade, logistics, anything like that. Like, you know, we, we were just basically students at the time and we just wanted to try something different than everybody else in our class. And so we started a company. We started a small company with my one of my classmates, one of my friends from the university. And, uh, you know, that basically led me to applying for university in China and ended up here starting a company and contributing to the ecosystem here and basically building that cross-border connection, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I can get more into detail, but, you know, just maybe one thing that, you know, was interesting and uh, that I'm still extremely grateful for, and actually I just feel I'm extremely lucky as well, is that, you know, to get to China back then through university, that was the easiest option. You know, like actually applying for universities, maybe for some sort of stipendium, you know, or for some sort of program, exchange program, and uh, basically, you know, just being an exchange student and getting a visa through university and exploring the country through that. And so I did that, but because back then there was literally no connectivity to China, there was no agreements between our university and the Chinese university. So you know, I literally had to cold call and I had to cold email universities in China and basically beg them for bringing me on or taking me on as an exchange student. And, uh, you know, I remember it just somehow ended up happening. You know, I just emailed a couple of universities. Some of them were, or maybe even one of them was actually replying quite actively. And then we kind of somehow set it up between my university and their university. And I ended up getting scholarship. I ended up getting quite a lot of money, you know, kind of to move into China because the university in Czech Republic was very grateful for this kind of agreement because they always wanted to do something with these universities, but they, you know, nobody really spent any time on that. And so that was just, you know, kind of like a small thing that that action and trying to do something different than everybody else. Everybody wanted to go to US. Everybody wanted to go to, you know, European universities, but for me and given that opportunity and running the business, it was completely different. And since there was not much competition and not many people cared about that, let's say journey or that path, then first of all, yes, it was a little bit easier to get there. And at the same time, you know, I could actually reap a lot of benefits because the university was grateful for this kind of, you know, even uh, service in a sense for them. So, so yeah, that's, that's just kind of to my, you know, educational background, I guess. Now that's amazing. Uh, and what's what's really interesting there is like you know you where you discussed going against the the, the flow or the the common pathways or routes you know from the rest of your peers. Um, did, did you find that it was easy in terms of your pursuit for you know going and actively looking for for positions in China in universities etc. Um, or did you find that you know for example that there was some degree of you know rejection etc. Like you talked about the serendipity. Um, yes. What role did that play in your uh, in in your looking and hunting for you know pathways as such and paving your own uh, journey? No, man. I you know it's a good question, and I would say that uh, you know I I would I would not say that I really perceived rejection because you know it was basically just I'm just gonna give it a shot and uh, you know it has to work out and if it doesn't work out I'm just gonna find a different way you know because I was so kind of excited to go because we were running the business. The business was doing quite well. And I was just dedicated that I have to go to China to check it out because we're making money thanks to a Chinese brand back then that was getting very popular and uh, is even more popular now. And so I was just like, I cannot uh, not know anything about China, right? And so, you know, I was kind of dedicated that I'm going to go. And the serendipity was there in that aspect that you know, basically after a couple emails, I don't even remember how many universities I, you know, I, I messaged, but I messaged universities in Hong Kong. I messaged universities in mainland China. You know, I was even looking at some, you know, universities probably in the region and uh, the serendipity and the, the, the luck was really in the, you know, and, and really it's, it's somehow it meant to be, I guess, because you know, the university that actually was proactively talking with me was based in the same city as my suppliers for that business. And of course, I didn't plan for that. You know, I didn't know that. It just like ended up being like that. And, uh, you know, so that was the lack, that was the serendipity 
that, uh, that allowed me to kind of like speed up that uh, process of adapting and even having some sort of connections here, even though I didn't have any friends. I didn't speak any Chinese back then. And uh, maybe I just studied something on the plane, you know, but uh, basically, you know, that kind of allowed me to speed up that, that process and really get excited about that new environment, which was hard to adapt to, honestly, because yes, like, you know, I was never really aware of, of anything about China. And so, so yeah, that's, uh, I wouldn't say rejection because I didn't really perceive it that way back then, but uh, it was definitely serendipitous. And I was lucky that I ended up in the place that was actually very practical even for the business because maybe if I ended up in a different location you know I may not have been so excited you know and I maybe would be disappointed to some extent so you know it's really as I said it's it's kind of the destiny type of stuff you know it, it was meant to be a hundred percent and I, I really like that as well the the attitude where you know like it's not rejection but you learn from the experiences and then you, you kind of uh if things fall into place as such through the active pursuit of, you know, looking and trying out things and trying out new, new kind of avenues that are not common, uh, especially within the, you know, the, the kind of context that you're in as well. What was also really interesting is, uh, you know, what you mentioned about your starting up a startup, you know, whilst you were at university. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, you know, for example, for uh, many students, uh, especially, you know, the audience that we're talking to at the moment, where the students come from the, the background of um, industrial design, product design, design engineering, um, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of their um, educational background and output is centered around, you know, innovation and, 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 and so forth. Um, you know, m many do aspire to go on and create startups like, uh, so m maybe sharing some advice is there in terms of how you got started, how you, you know, pursued it and some, some tips uh, along the way as well. Yeah, you know, it's uh, honestly, when I, every time I think about this, I, uh, you know, I think it's a great story. Let's see how, how much it's gonna resonate with, uh, with the audience here. But basically, you know, I, I attended, let's say, one of the most prestigious university in Czech Republic, you know, like quote unquote, whatever. Uh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't want to say it just to sound like, you know, I'm the best, but, you know, that was, that was the case. You know, it was very premium university. It was very hard to get into. And uh, that basically meant why I am mentioning it is that most of my classmates, they were extremely strong academically. And, uh, you know, even I remember when I go to the university first day, uh, you know, I, I really was kind of even afraid because I had to catch up with so many things. You know, many of my classmates back then, they already spent three years living abroad and their language was completely fluent. And, you know, I was just kind of like, you know, a guy from a small town, never lived abroad, studied English for a couple of years actually, and didn't really know how to use that language properly. And so I was really kind of intimidated, you know, by that. And so, uh, you know, that kind of led to the fact that you know, most of my classmates were really top of the class and most of them would go after, you know, like, you know, they would go into Cambridge, they would go into some of the top universities for masters in Europe, or they would even go to Harvard University, or they would all strive for BCG, McKinsey right after college. And, uh, you know, I have nothing against these companies you know like i i i respect these people that can that can accomplish such a feat and i have so many friends in those communities but i kind of felt back then that you know maybe i'm not good enough because i'm kind of i'm coming from a completely different background you know like i'm i'm just like trying so hard to catch up with everyone and you know like i i, I just i kind of even sometimes so maybe i don't belong you know and so that was maybe the motivation that that and that helped me to start a business because i was like how can I compete with these like super uh, talented and uh, very, you know, like just, just academically super strong people for these jobs, right? For these like McKinsey BCG type of jobs. So I always seek to do something. I sought to do something completely different, you know? And so, you know, that led me to actually, before I started the business, it led me to a startup company because there was a company, I don't know if people will be familiar, but Rocket Internet back then was setting up a venture in Czech Republic. And uh, through a personal connection, through one association that I was basically very active, active member of, 
at the university, you know, I got introduced to the managing director of this startup of this of this new venture, and uh, we really got along very well. You know, we had a couple conversations, and I was basically the first employee of that startup company, even though I wasn't a founder, but I was basically, you know, the first employee, and it showed me this amazing, you know, environment and ecosystem of like building something from zero. And you you gotta take ownership, you know, from day one. You know, like it's not about it's you just you just gotta, you know, like go there and wait for what people tell you to do. Like you gotta take ownership, you gotta figure out, you know, how to build things from from nothing. And so that showed me this world. And you know, I basically was sold from day one. You know, I really enjoy that environment and that approach of the people that I worked with. And so that led me to starting a company because I was like, hey. I just want to be an entrepreneur. Maybe I don't even want to work in a big corporation. I, I just want to try being an entrepreneur. And I just did it. You know, like I was kind of still in that shield of university, right? Like I was still a student, so I didn't have much pressure. So that was kind of the back cover to start the company and not feel like super under pressure that I need to make money from day one or I need to do this from day one. If I fail, then okay, then I will just take, I will just get a job. So, you know, all these things kind of, uh, you know, combined that allowed me to start a company. And, uh, you know, again, I think serendipitously it somehow succeeded. It wasn't a huge success. We didn't build a billion dollar company. We didn't raise any money. It was positive cash flow, positive business from day one. We sold or I sold the share in the company when we were making somewhere between 50, 30 to 50 K USD monthly revenue. So it wasn't a huge, huge business, but it was really that experience that I needed to uh, to basically, you know, just kind of develop myself and like kind of even know what I want in the future. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of the journey. And you know, these these lessons learned, I would say, you know, don't always go after what everybody else goes after. You know, like try to understand yourself, your motivations. I I mean, I wouldn't say that I completely understood myself. Honestly, it was more like. I maybe wasn't confident enough that I can compete with people uh, like my classmates to go after these like super quote unquote fancy jobs and, and really prominent jobs and companies. And that's why I was looking for a different path. But, uh, you know, yeah, somehow I ended up in a place that I really enjoy to be in. And so, you know, I would kind of the learning that I that I drawn from that is is really try to learn about yourself as much as you can. And as early as you can, by trying different things, working on different side hustles or with different people, supporting different people on their journeys while you're at college or at the university, because you can afford that. You can afford to lose that time that, uh, you know, at that time. So, yeah, that would be probably the major learning that I took away. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And in terms of uh, your startups, I know like you were the founder of, of YCG and Co. And you're the co-founder of the D network and you, you've obviously been the community director of the startup grind in China as well. Um, it, tell us a little bit about your, your startups. I mean, how many you've had so far and you know, what, what they were, what kind of sector they were positioned in and how far you've taken them, which ones are active and not active. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the very first company uh, that I'm not part of anymore, it was basically this company, as I mentioned, it was the trading company taking the products from China selling them in Czech Republic, Slovakia, mostly. The company still exists. The, the, the store, the e-commerce shop still exists, but I'm not part of it. I basically exited that. It wasn't a huge exit. I didn't become a millionaire. It was really like just a great experience. And uh, I just knew that I want to do something else. I want to pursue other ventures. So that's why I decided to exit from that. Uh, but uh, very proud of that first venture because it wasn't a failure or it taught us a lot of things. And, uh, you know, then actually, yeah, you're right. So, you know, after I exited this venture, I worked for Startup Grind. It was the opportunity that I got while I was in China for the first two years. And basically I was running their China business. I was running their APEC business. For Startup Grind, running their business doesn't necessarily mean hardcore business. It actually meant just building up a brand, building up operations of the company getting a lot of partners on board, you know, building up an ambassador program, building up a large community of individuals that want to create kind of positive impact on the startup ecosystems in Asia and China specifically, because that's where I was based. And uh, that opportunity, 
even though it wasn't really a hardcore startup where you would have a product to sell and scaling in terms of revenue, et cetera. But it was really eye-opening kind of experience because I was meeting so many different people from so many different backgrounds and cultures because I was traveling all over Asia. I spent time in India for two months. I went to Korea, Singapore, Australia, Japan, you know, and of course, China. And, and I would basically just meet these people and we would be trying to figure out like how we can empower their ecosystems with certain resources, with mentorship, with coaching, with experts investors, even companies like Google that were supporting us on this journey to basically empower those people that want to start companies, want to start a startup and just give them the, 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 the push or, you know, even the resources, you know, that they need to basically, you know, get on that journey. And so, uh, you know, that wasn't really my company, but it was extremely entrepreneurial in a sense that I was, again, responsible, you know, like it was my responsibility to build this up basically from scratch you know we had some presence when i was joining but it wasn't it wasn't really stable or there wasn't really structure you know and so so that was kind of another entrepreneurial kind of venture that i was on and then when i left the company you know yes i i ended up starting this ycg and co which is basically you know nothing fancy honestly at this point it's uh you know a boutique consultancy company and uh, we're helping people to do business in china or to learn about China, to see what's going on here in terms of tech investments and stuff like that. And so uh, that's a company that I've been running for past year, I actually started in uh, you know late, late 2019. So right before the COVID-19, which wasn't the best timing, honestly, because I, I left my, my previous job and then I started a company thinking I'm gonna be on fire, I'm gonna be rock and rolling because I had so many plans and so many potential clients. And, then COVID hits and suddenly nothing happens. Suddenly, you know, you're thinking like, wow, like, do I have enough savings to make it through the year if we don't make any money, you know? And so basically that was, uh, that was uh, you know, pretty unfortunate timing, but, you know, luckily we, we managed to go through it and now it's picking up again, you know, even though of course the world is still suffering, but, uh, you know, the business, uh, the business is, is picking up because also companies, even in Europe, we work mostly with European companies at this point. In Europe, uh, the companies know that they need to invest in the long term. And, uh, you know, if they ever wanted to do business in China, then, you know, there is no way to stop or there is no reason for them to stop now. You know, it's maybe actually time to, to double down because many people will give up. And so there is going to be some sort of room for them to, to really push through, you know, in this period. And so, you know, that's what we're currently doing. It was still the very beginning, honestly. It's, uh, you know, I have uh, I have few partners on board. You know, I have uh, people that are supporting me on this journey. We're actually expanding our team as we speak. We're looking for some full-time hires and employees to support us on this journey locally. And, uh, you know, so so that's uh, that's basically, you know, that, uh, that stage, you know. And the D network, it's, I wouldn't really call it a startup. It's really, you know, I would say a community or it's uh, kind of like a, like, a, like a small venture. You know, we're basically really trying to build a cross-border community, empower people. You know, whenever somebody comes to China, an investor, a company, entrepreneur, somebody who wants to do something here, we want to have that platform that they can learn. They can learn from those people that have been there, done it, and they have been through all the challenges and they have suffered the failures. And, you know, we want to give them this opportunity to learn. And at the same time, of course, give them access to that network whenever it's relevant, whenever the people can help or want to get in touch. Maybe they can work on projects together. We want to give them that platform because, of course, China still in this point of time it's still relatively closed ecosystem, even though it's getting better and better with, uh, you know, many Chinese people speaking much better English than five years ago or, you know, 10 years ago, but it's still relatively closed ecosystem because there is no Google, there's no LinkedIn really, there is no Facebook, there's no platforms that we're used to, uh, to connect with people in the West, you know? And so, you know, it's really, really that platform that we're trying to build. Yeah, definitely. So some really interesting points that you've raised there. Um, one of the ones is, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, enabling others to connect where, once they come to China and, and learn from others who kind of navigated that pathway. Um, I assume that yourself, uh, you didn't have that kind of resource when you, uh, you know, left the Czech Republic and, and, and moved over to China. So um, how do you kind of uh, build your local? Yeah, you know, 
not knowing Chinese at the time as yes. well. And moving great to question. A foreign country. Mm -hmm. Very great question, you know, and uh, I'm happy that you asked it because, you know, I think it's honestly, you know, there's, it's not a rocket science, you know, and, uh, you know, every time I talk about this, sometimes I, I, I even feel like people will not take it seriously because it just sounds so simple, you know, but uh, it's really, you know, just the mindset. You know, it's not really that you need a specific skill. Of course, like, I mean, there are people that are more op open-minded or more, let's say, extroverted than others. I, I, I respect that, right? There are people that are more introverted. They don't like events. They don't like social settings with many people. So I respect that. Of course, that's something that you either have to work on or, you know, you have to accept it and maybe, you know, kind of uh, a different, different path which is totally fine. But, you know, if you're the person that wants to travel, wants to even, you know, kind of put themselves in a position that they go to a different country, completely different culture, then I kind of suspect that you're kind of extroverted or more extroverted than, than, uh, than, than other people, because otherwise you wouldn't even make that choice at the first place. And so, you know, for people like that, you know, it's really just the mindset because yes, you're absolutely right. I didn't speak any Chinese when I landed here. You know, I, I couldn't communicate with people in Chinese, even if it was basic Chinese. And so I always had to use English. And of course, then, you know, what happens, and it happened to me many times at the beginning, that you feel kind of awkward, right? You're, you're a foreigner, you know, and uh, you're kind of the outsider, you know, nothing about the country, you know, nothing about what's going on in the city, really. And then you go to an event full of locals, of Chinese people and you basically just push them to speak English to you because you know you don't understand Chinese and so you know yes it would be sometimes awkward people would laugh at you people would be kind of like you know thinking like like who the hell are you you know like like what do you do here so you would get those looks that doesn't mean that people necessarily think bad things about you but you would get those looks and so that would sometimes discourage people, it even discouraged me sometimes, you know, I, I went through those experiences and I would be like, oh, maybe I should go home, you know, maybe I, I should not be here. But really, you know, that's the mistake, right? Like, you know, I learned later on that it's really just about the mindset that, you know, of course, you know, you gotta push yourself out of the comfort zone and, and you know, you don't have any choice, you know, you cannot communicate in Chinese. So, so like you just communicate in English and you only communicate with those that wanna communicate with you. And of course, at the same time, you work on the language and, and you try to improve and, and maybe in one or two years from, from the first moment, you will be able to communicate in certain, you know, other language and, and you will be able to, to kind of have different conversations and the rapport is going to be easier to create. And so, you know, you need to do those things at the same time. Uh, also, another thing, of course, you know, you can find the expats events, you can find those networks of expats that have been in China for a long time, they already understand how to move around and how to kind of, you know, exist in that ecosystem and thrive in that ecosystem. And so you can, you can hang out with them first and maybe you can ask for some advice and maybe they can introduce you to some people. So, so this is really how we start. It's really the mindset push through the awkward moments. And uh, even if you cannot push at first, maybe you fail once, twice, three times, just uh, keep trying because then eventually you will, you will find out that it's actually not that difficult. And, you know, people are actually much nicer than you think, even though again, you may not think so from the very first moment. And so, you know, that's, that's basically like one learning that, that I had or re revelation that I had from the, from the, from the very beginning. Amazing. And uh, just, just a little uh, thought or a, a question that I can kind of uh, add in there. Sometimes will that not work in your favor? Like, for example, you were saying that sometimes you were the only one there, the kind of almost the odd one out, right? In, yes. in, a, group, in a group of locals. But sometimes, like for example, um, you know, considering if you're going to do a presentation somewhere, or you're in a in a in a, in a set of group interviews, or you know, like a, where where you're one amongst many, um, does that not make you a lot more memorable? For example, you know, the only kind of foreigner in that in that crowd, or the only one who's not speaking the local dialect, does that not make you stand out and a bit more memorable as such? And Absolutely, what, man. What other kind of uh, alongside you know being memorable, being uh, someone who stands out? And what other kind of tips would there be for like for uh, for, for someone to remember you? Are they be in a, in a interview setting, in a networking event, 
and how to kind of extend that um, connection and make that impression and kind of sustain it beyond the meeting. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very good point and I fully agree with you. Of course, you know, you stand out and you should take it, you should, you should use it to your advantage. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, back then, five years ago, it was, it, was, it was really good, you know, to at some point or to some extent to be a foreigner in China and to do what I was doing because it was very welcome. It was really, China was even seeking to learn from foreigners and from Silicon Valley how to build startups, how to do that innovation how to create that those ecosystems and so you know i was very fortunate you know and and yes you're right you know you're more memorable and you know so you should you should you should basically play with that and uh you know to your question or to the point that you mentioned like how do you really keep in touch are some of the tips to to really you know get that network up and up and going it's really uh, you know, I think there are two things. And uh, again, it's maybe fairly simple, but many people don't do that, you know, and it's, it's really, you know, you got to keep showing up, right? So, you know, I, I remember a couple of first events, a couple of those first communities that I wanted to be part of, like, yeah, people didn't really take me seriously at first, because they didn't know me, you know, I was the outsider coming in. And so, you know, I had to prove myself. And how you prove yourself is that you just keep showing up and you try to add much, as much value as you can. And sometimes the value that you're adding is just helping out with the event. You don't necessarily have to be a speaker. You don't have to be a guy that, you know, gives people advice. You don't have to be, you know, the person that organizes everything and brings the valuable mentor with you. It's really sometimes just help them out with uh, cleaning the venue after the event or, you know, just be there at the registration and, you know, just try to show, you know, the support hands. And, uh, you know, of course, that's something that people always appreciate, you know, like, especially if we're talking about some sort of communities, you know, or associations, they're run by students or they're run by people that, that don't do it for money. Right. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's one thing, you know, like you always have to just show up and bring some sort of value. You know, and the second point is, you know, like, yeah, you got to stay in touch and you got to follow up. And, you know, the, the always, you know, what I sometimes even got from people, you know, like and and this is actually something that I that I take as a, as a very large compliment, you know, and it's like many people told me, hey, Jan, you're probably the only guy I know that whenever you say that you're going to send me some article or you're going to introduce me to somebody after the event, you actually do it, <laughs> you know, and so. This is the way, right? Again, it's bringing value, but it's also about the fact that sometimes you go to an event, you know, and people meet you and they're excited at the event and they tell you about all these tips and things that they learn about. They even promise they connect you with somebody, but they maybe don't follow through because maybe they get busy, you know, they're busy at work and they don't really think that this is the most important thing they should be doing. And of course, if you don't do it the first day after the event, then you forget. It's just very natural to forget. You know, I'm not saying that I've never for forgotten. Of course, I've forgotten as well. And it's usually because you don't do it right away and you don't follow on those promises that you make that evening. And so what I would be doing, you know, I would be actually just following up that, that evening when I got home. I would be adding people on social media. I would be sending them that information. If I mentioned some article, if I mentioned something, some book, I would send it to them as a link and just say like, hey, check it out. This is what we talked about, talked about today, tonight. And, you know, I think it would be valuable for you, for your business or for your friend that you mentioned. And so, you know, it's really that small thing, you know, really like keeping the promises, following up on a timely basis and just keep showing up because that's something that really builds the network and that builds your brand and people will start taking you seriously sooner or later, you know, and people start talking about you because not everybody needs to know you thoroughly. Maybe some people will not know you and, uh, you know, they will just wait for the other person to say, hey, Jan is a really cool guy. He really helped me with this, 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 this and that. And he really follows through, you know, and so then people will be like, oh, wow, maybe I should talk to him, you know, so, so this is really, you know, just the, the fundamentals and, uh, and again, it's simple. Everybody can do it. I don't think you need to have some special superpower. You need to be extremely extroverted to do this type of stuff. It's really just having a system structure and, you know, being, be willing to follow up on a timely basis. No, definitely. And totally agree with that. And yourself, you're also known as, you know, the, your China guy. And you were featured on LinkedIn in terms of the power profile list in 2018. One of the most uh, viewed, engaged members in LinkedIn China. 
it, that that list uh, just to kind of contextualize it also had like the ceo of uh it's innovation venture the ceo of starbucks china um um htc the chinese president the the founder of zen funding amongst many others as well so i'm saying that's a, that's a massive uh, accolade for yourself but i'm saying how do you build your network and how do you you reach that stage in terms of you know networking and what's the value and the power of using something like linkedin yeah you know i think again i i will emphasize it again it's really you got to keep showing up you know and uh you know, in this regard, you know, what you just mentioned, yes, you know, again, I, I guess I was lucky because I was at the right time in the right place. And, uh, you know, I came to China five years ago. And ever since I came, I was always doing something. I was posting on LinkedIn. I was creating videos. I was creating podcasts with people and sharing that information on my, on my LinkedIn. And because you know, there wasn't many foreigners. There wasn't many foreigners five years ago, four years ago doing that stuff. So I would naturally stand out. I would naturally be the most active person in that vertical, in that category in China, you know, or among the most engaged and active because again, there wasn't many people doing it. And yes, LinkedIn wasn't a huge thing three years ago in China, four years ago. Now there's so many people posting about China. There's so many people running agencies and this and using LinkedIn to, to basically build their businesses. And so it's much harder to stand out. And yes, I, I didn't get the award later on because there's just so much competition and, you know, just, uh, you know, so many people to choose from. So, so then it became much harder. So, you know, I, I, I would just say, yes, I was at the right time in the right place and I just followed, followed through, you know, I was showing up, I was, you know, creating that content and I was sharing something that people found valuable, you know, and uh, that basically allowed me to, to enter into that list and that list, of course, or even this recognition, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it allowed me to meet many different people and uh, even kind of get that, you know, I would say credibility in a sense, you know, that like people, would, people that don't know me, you know, they would suddenly think, okay, maybe, you know, this guy is a real deal because he has been doing it for some time and, you know, people has recognized him for something, you know? So, so this is, uh, you know, again, I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm also quite lucky for this, but you know, the, your China guy, you know, it's actually a very funny story. You know, I, I mean, you know, many people sometimes even look, uh, look at me and they're like, like, why would you call yourself your China guy? Like you're not Chinese. And, you know, you didn't even speak Chinese when you came to China. Like, like, who the hell are you? You know, like, what do you have to say about this? How, you know, you're not this expert, whatever. Like, I get this from time to time that people, people just like, I don't know if it's because of, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, again, maybe I just got lucky at the right time. And, and, and maybe some people don't really wish, wish uh, good things, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, it's really organic, you know, I actually never had that idea myself, you know, it, it really came to be in a sense that since I was this guy posting on LinkedIn about China all the time. And I was always sharing with my friends, even on Facebook. And I was just so active. And actually even, I have a YouTube channel, which is not active that much right now, but I was actually traveling as I was traveling around China, I would make vlogs on my iPhone and I would basically show people around like what I'm doing, what this city is all about, what are some of the things that you have probably never seen, and I am seeing it for the first time. So I was making these blogs, and then people would start calling me China guy. People would be like, hey, Jan, you're my guy in China. You know, whenever I need something in China, I will call you, you know? And so people started like tweeting at me. People started calling me this, and I was like, guys, this is actually pretty cool. Like, I should act on it. So, you know, I just basically went to Instagram and Twitter and I searched if the, if the ID is available and it was, and I was like, okay, let's just do it. You know, like, I don't care what other people are going to think. Of course, some people will be like, like, why are you doing it? You're not Chinese, whatever. But, uh, you know, I just think it's pretty funny and, you know, it's easy to remember, like my name is so hard to pronounce for many people. They don't even know that you pronounce it Jan instead of Jen or, you know, Schmeikal, Smeshka. Like people don't know how to pronounce my name because I come from Czech Republic, small country. Nobody studies the language, of course. So I don't blame them. And so I was like, I got to take this opportunity and have something simple to remember for them so that they can come to me and they can 
basically, you know, can build up the brand and, you know, like it's going to be good for the business. It's going to be good for many other things we're going to be doing. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny story that it was crowdsourced, crowdsourced name for me, you know? <laughs> that's, that's a brilliant story. And to be honest, it, it kind of links in with uh, what you talked about before, about being memorable, you know, so, something short, something sweet. Uh, it's, you know, it's sl slightly unusual as well, because a, a, a non-Chinese uh, called the China guy and all of that kind of stuff. So it just makes makes your brand a lot stronger as well in, in that sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, you know, that's that's one thing, you know, of course, you know, I would like to just maybe comment on that because, you know, again, like I, I'm not saying that, like, I, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining, but like, yes, sometimes I will get people looking at me through the fingers, you know, like, you know, what, what, what are you doing here? You know, like you're, you're not, you know, like you, you should not be calling yourself that whatever, but you know, it's really like, you know, using the name or having something memorable or something easy to remember. That's one thing that's, that's, that's core of branding, right? Like no matter what you do, if you start a company, if you start a startup and you want to sell a product, like, like, yes, if you have something that is, that people can easily remember, that's one part of the success, but it's not everything, right? Like, don't forget that the product also has to be good. If the product is, sorry to say it like that, but if the product is shit, then nobody will care about the brand. Nobody will care about having amazing, easy to remember, you know, simple to type into URL, URL kind of brand, you know? And so you really have to follow through, you know? Brand is amazing, catch attention, get the eyes, eyeballs but then you need to keep showing up you know and in my case it's really like yeah i keep doing it you know like it's not that i take the take the brand and i do nothing with it like we we keep hosting events we keep connecting people i keep studying chinese i keep being more and more deep in it because i want to prove myself that i'm worthy of that you know and so you know you got to make that 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 product that you know that brand you know, fundamentally good. Otherwise, it's not going to stick around for too long, you know? So, so that's that reminder that like, you know, you just got to keep showing up regardless if you have a sexy name, sexy brand or not, you know, like you, you got to, you got to build that, those fundamentals behind the substance has to be there. 100%. And al alongside that, you have to deliver as well. Exactly what you promised. Of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you don't deliver, then, you know, nobody cares about the brand, you know, like uh, the brand can be easily destroyed, you know, the, the reputation can be easily destroyed. And so, of course, you will never be able to deliver fully all the time. Of course, we have had some clients that, you know, that were not super happy, that were not 100% happy, but, you know, it happens all the time. But like, you want to make sure that, let's say 80% or 90% of the time, you do more than you're supposed to do. You know, you over deliver. And, uh, you know, that's the way you, you, you keep, you keep kind of, uh, let's say succeeding or growing in the future. You can never satisfy everyone 100%, like forget about it. That's impossible because sometimes it's a bad timing. Sometimes it's not only your fault. Sometimes it's certain circumstances that will, you know, not allow you to perform 100%, but you got to push through that, you know, through that failure, let's say, and, you know, you got to find a way to over deliver next time. You know, and so, you know, that's that's something to keep in mind. Amazing. And a lot of what you mentioned uh, echoes some of the other guest lecturers uh, that preceded you as well. Um, for example, you know, talking about uh, turning up and popping up on LinkedIn. You know, if someone, uh, if there's a post that's, you know, receiving a lot of attention, uh, commenting, contributing, adding something valuable to that. And then obviously, you know, someone notices you and then you, they, they notice you again and again and again and you, you manage to connect. And like once you've connected and, you know, for example, you obviously reached a, a, a really good, um, you know, status being uh, in the power profile list um, in 2018. How do you then capitalize and leverage those connections? And how do you uh, then, you know, get something out of that? Amazing question, man. I think, I think this is really relevant and I wish, I wish I spent more time or I was listening to more people when I was, when I was going through this transition, you know, it's, um, it can be hard, you know, and uh, actually I would say that most of the people fail with this. And I think I'm also still partially failing, you know, but I don't look at it again as a failure. I actually look at it, you know, because I'm a long-term player, you know, and uh, I am a guy that, you know, I am not the type of person that if I have some connections, if I build some connections, I want to just monetize it and squeeze it out and 
and uh, you know, by basically ask for favors every single day. Like I'm not that guy. Doesn't mean you should never ask for a favor. You should ask whenever you think it's appropriate, whenever you think you need it, you should ask because if you don't ask, then you get, you get nothing. And you never know even if you can get something if you don't ask, right? So, so you should definitely ask, but I'm that kind of person that like, I rather give 10 times and maybe ask once than the other way around, you know? And so, you know, I'm looking at everything a long-term play. And so I can maybe even tell you that I would say that I haven't really fully monetized or really fully leveraged all the things that we have done, you know, maybe the network, all the communities and some of the connections I I haven't really fully monetized it yet because, you know, I want to do it only when it feels right. You know, I don't want to do it under pressure. I don't want to do it because somebody else is telling me you should monetize, you should monetize. I want to do it when it feels right. Of course, you know, I'm a practical guy. You know, you need to pay the bills. You need to take care of it. You need to make sure the business is there. You can take care of the people that you work with. And so, of course, we work on that. We pay, pay a lot of attention to that, that we can have the fundamentals done but uh ultimately you know i'm playing a long-term game so i don't care if i am gonna let's say capitalize and it sounds weird but you know i don't care if i'm gonna capitalize on some connection or something we have built now in 10 years i don't care and i actually think that the way the fact that i can do that is a superpower. It's really something that is unique and that sets you up for success because you're making choices based on your long-term strategy, based on your long-term vision, and you're not making choices based on short-term needs, you know? And so, of course, you need to put yourself in a position that you can afford to do so because let's say, yeah, if you don't have money, let's say if you fail with your business, business you need to get a job and then you need to sacrifice maybe the long-term vision for some time, you know, to just like get the, get back on track. But once you're in a position that you can, you can afford to be the long-term thinker, always take that path because that's ultimately something that, uh, you know, you control and uh, it's not going to control you because if you just keep monetizing everything and looking at everything as a transaction, then, you know, you may actually lose control very quickly. And you may lose the brand or you may lose the things that you have been working so hard towards over the past three years very quickly, you know? And so, you know, I think it's actually very, very, very big luxury to be able to do, to, to be able to do so. Amazing. It, what would you say that you're good at or great at and things that you wish you were good at? So obviously we know that like, you know, you're, you're really good at networking and connecting and building these links and networks. But beyond yeah. that, like, uh, what else is there? What other dimensions are there to, to Yan? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, first of all, absolutely. I think I'm, I'm very good at building communities, uh, you know, connecting people, fi figuring out, you know, like, uh, like connecting the dots, right? It's really, it's really more than connecting people, it's connecting the dots because it's not just simply connecting people. You need to make sure that those people can add each other value because if you don't connect wrong people, you're just wasting everybody's time. And so you don't want to do that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, I think I've learned and I think I have some sort of like maybe, maybe, uh, you know, inner, inner skill to be able to do this and to have that gut feeling that, that helps me, that allows me to do this most of the time, you know, nine out of 10 or 9.5 out of 10 times, you know? And so that's one thing. The second thing, you know, I really enjoy, you know, kind of building stuff up, like from zero to one, you know, I, I don't necessarily, you know, I would say I'm, I'm the best, you know, at, uh, you know, like, like getting from, from one to 100 in terms of doing all the analytical stuff and, you know, all these things, but, you know, kicking things off, setting up systems and structures at the beginning and just following through, you know, to make sure that things can happen you know, being the catalyst for things, you know, like, I also think that that's something that basically throughout my career, that's, that's who I was, you know, starting a startup, starting the company, then leaving, starting kicking off the communities, then handing it over to another team, starting another community, starting a podcast, you know, starting another company, and basically bringing some clients in and actually even having other people helping me out. I'm not always the one that is, that is executing everything, but I am, I'm pretty good at bringing those things in because I know how to look for the connecting the dots, how to connect the right people, how to bring the value that 
people meet at the right time. And so, you know, really being that kind of initiator and catalyst. And, uh, you know, one thing that I wish I knew, and uh, maybe at some point I will, I will get to it, but, uh, you know, I, I wish I could code, you know, like I, 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 I don't have, you know, this, this engineering skill set, And I think it's a superpower in this world because, you know, if you can code, you know, you can build things, you know, you can literally build things overnight. I know it's getting easier with no code and with all these drag and drop systems, but it's not the same as actually being fully in control of building something and coming up with the structure logic and actually making it work. And so, you know, that's something that I wish I knew. <laughs> Amazing. And then in terms of, uh, you know, being able to connect all of the dots and put the dots into position and, and, and make those networking connections, um, obviously you're in a specific context at the moment, you're in China. And th there's differences, you know, with, with, between China and Europe and, and, and other countries at the moment in terms of what's available to you, um, you know, what's available nationally and, and internationally as well. Um, how does it, your position at the moment differ to, for example, if you were in Europe, for example, the access to social network and, and other things like, what, what, do you see or, or forecast that you would have uh, done things differently or enhance certain uh, pathways? No, you know, you're right. You know, I mean, I mean, in China, it's, uh, you know, there is, there is not really these kinds of social networks, right? There are different ones. Uh, but they're local. And that means that, you know, you as a foreigner don't really have full access to it because certainly you don't speak the language, you know, you, 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 you cannot understand everything, even, even though I speak the language now, or at least to some extent, you know, of course, I'm still not like, it's not my mother tongue. And, you know, it's something that I will still struggle with. I will be much slower to react to things, you know, in, in this regard. And so, you know, that's, uh, that's something that is definitely, you know, a disadvantage you know i i i think you know it's it's actually you know it's a disadvantage but you know that's that's just how the market works here and you got to be here physically you know like i mean i mean that's always what we what we tell our clients you know like if you want to do something in china forget about zoom i know everybody wants to do zoom these days because that's the only thing we can do mm -hmm. and uh you know in the west it works pretty well but in china not really you know like you gotta really you know be there you need to shake hands you know, you know, you can do certain things, maybe when you already have built up that relationship, when you already have the foundation, the basis for that, maybe you can follow up over social media, over, you know, messenger or something else that works here, but uh, to get it going, it's not enough, you know? And so, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if I would do something differently, I don't think that there is a way to do it differently, you know, like you just got to adjust you know, to the situation and you got to go with the flow. And uh, yeah, it's true that not only in China, but in Asia in general, you know, it's more face to face. It's more really personal relationships than anything else. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's just the fact and you gotta, you gotta play with that because it's hard to go against the market. It's hard to go against, you know, what people are used to here. hundred percent. Totally agree with that as well. And then uh, that leads quite nicely onto the next question. If say for example the, the audience today, right? Um, the, the students, designers, design engineers, um, design engineering students. Uh, what attributes would you want uh, as a student or a graduate going out into the industry, going out into the world, in terms of being able to network and being able to connect, being able to join the dots as such, and navigate your own pathways? What what, what sh character and attributes should you have as, as a student or a graduate? And what can you develop to kind of enhance your skill set? Yeah, you know, again, um, you know, I, I think, you know, you can certainly develop all these things because, you know, I, I'm just like reflecting on this right now. And uh, I would never consider myself that I was always extremely extroverted guy, you know, mm -hmm. like I was growing up in a small town and I was never the, celebrity or the guy that was always in the spotlight you know I wasn't that kind of person I I was maybe even looking up to certain people that were and uh and so you know I think I also kind of developed this because I I just decided okay or maybe the circumstances maybe it wasn't just purely my decision but the circumstances led me to the you know to to basically you know leave my hometown and go to a big city and then you kind of are on your own and it's hard at the beginning i remember and i went i actually even left for high school 
and I was in a dormitory alone, no friends in a different town. I remember I was crying, you know, at some point, you know, I was like, you know, like, like, uh, you know, maybe that introverted in a sense that like, like it was very uncomfortable for me, you know, for let's say first couple of weeks, of course, you know, like, like you got to push through, you know, like you, you know, if, if, uh, if you have that kind of mindset or if the environment allows you to kind of, you know, just persevere and push, then of course, like you will get used to it, right? Like that's how we grow. We're in uncomfortable situations. We go to the gym, we lift the weights, it hurts, but then we grow, we get stronger, right? So, so it's, it's basically the same thing. It doesn't matter if you study the language, if you go to the gym, if you want to learn how to, you know, basically be, be more open with meeting many different people. So it's all the same thing. So, you know, for me, I was, I was kind of awkward at the beginning, but the circumstances and the fact that I put myself in those positions, uh, you know, of, uh, of discomfort, you know, helped me to develop these things. And so then I remember going to Prague, you know, for, for university after high school, then basically I would be much more comfortable with those things. And, you know, I would be able to learn more and excel at those things. And so, you know, yeah, just going back to your question, I think it's really just about the mindset and, you know, not being afraid of those awkward situations because they will happen anyways, even if you want or not in one context or the other, you will always find yourself in certain awkward situation. And so, you know, it's better to embrace it and maybe look at it as an opportunity for growth, even though you feel bad, you know, two days when it happens, you know, like you feel like, you know, I will never go there again. You know, it was just so awful. I don't feel good. But, you know, after two, three days, you forget. Or after one or two weeks, you forget anyways. You know, and so, you know, just just use it as an opportunity to learn and just push through those limits. Because it's really just the mindset. It's not really that uh, you have to be skilled for something, that you have to have some, some sort of talent for something necessarily. It's really just about keep showing up and having that mindset that, that you really want to push through. And of course, you know, you have to be self-aware at the same time, because sometimes maybe, you know, yes, maybe we are in certain disadvantages, you know, for certain things. Like, like if you, if you're one meter 60, you're probably not going to become an NBA rock star, right? Like, like you should probably pick a different sport. So, you know, you need to be aware of those practicalities, but at the same time, you know, like, like push through those awkward moments and just don't give up so easily. You know, I, I know it sounds cliche. It's, it's kind of, stuff that everybody always says don't give up right just keep pursuing but you know on my own example i am i'm still far from being extremely successful but i can already tell that you know this was definitely when i reflect on those situations this was definitely part of the journey that allowed me to even be in china right now and to do what i do amazing and then and then uh, post covid right um the current situation we're in uh, how do you see things changing um for society for designers, for engineers, what are the challenges and how do you see like uh, us navigating these in, 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 in the coming months and, and years? I think, you know, designers and, and engineers, actually, I think, you know, you guys are, you know, you have pretty big advantage because, you know, we're living, we're living in a tech world and, you know, you are a designer, you're an engineer, you can do this work from anywhere, anytime. You just need to be connected to the internet and you need to have your computer with you. And so, you know, I actually think that uh, people that are in this group watching this, they're not really the endurge, endurger, like the, 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 speech, the species that is, that is in danger. You know, I, I actually don't think so. I think, you know, people will actually, people like this may even benefit from this pretty, pretty well, you know, because companies are getting much more open to remote working, you know, in certain countries and in certain companies, it's already a huge standard right, to work remotely even for the next 12 months. And, you know, that means that the companies will get used to it. And if it's not a complete disaster, it will stay to some extent, you know. And so basically, you know, I, I actually think that, uh, you know, people that have this kind of skill set that basically is connected to technology, is connected to, you know, the, the, the industry 4.0, whatever you want to call it, then uh, I actually think that you have pretty, pretty huge advantage compared to other industries or compared to other students, you know, that are studying something that is much more linked to, you know, actually being somewhere in a specific time in a specific place, right? So, you know, we'll see how long the 
COVID is going to last. I hope it's going to be over very, very soon because, of course, it's it's never good. The situation is never good for 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 anyone, or at least most of the people. You know, unless you're making a lot of money due to that. But uh, basically, you know, yeah, I think I think people should not be too worried. You know, especially in your class. <laughs> Amazing. And would would you like to share any final thoughts or any final words? Yeah, you know, I think we, we, we discussed most of the things that I actually wanted to talk about. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, just, I just hope that, you know, it will be perceived more, you know, as some sort of motivation. Maybe people can use it as, uh, or people can use me, you know, as an example that they can relate to much more. Because again, I'm still in the process, you know, I'm in the process of, of building stuff we're still getting started, you know, even though, yes, we maybe have some foundation, we have a couple of years of experience, but we're still at the very beginning of what we're trying to achieve. And so, you know, I hope maybe, maybe this way it's going to be more relatable to people. And so, uh, you know, that's just something that I hope for. And, and of course, if people would like to continue the conversation, if they would like to reach out, if they have any specific questions, or if I can provide some specific insight, be it for China or anything else, I would like to just encourage people to reach out to me anytime. They can find me on LinkedIn, you know, just search for your China guy and you will find me. And, uh, you know, I, I just appreciate this opportunity that you gave me and hopefully, you know, it was insightful or at least, at least, at least helpful, helpful for one person, then I will be satisfied. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And, uh, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, obviously eight hours ahead now in China. And you know, for sharing your educational background, your experiences, um, insights and advices throughout the, the talk as well. Um, so th thanks a lot for your time. I've shared uh, you know, the details of yourself um, and the, the talk ahead of uh, this particular lecture. And you, you have your links to your social media pages, um, LinkedIn, Instagram uh, as well. So they'll also get to see, you know, um, connect with you online and get a feel of the, the work that you do. But finish off, uh, what do you see yourself doing next? Like what's next for Jan? You know, since we are still at the very beginning of what we are doing right now, I, I, I don't even think about, you know, what's next. I, I just hope that in the next uh, couple of years to come and maybe even uh, many, many years to come, we're just gonna continue doing very good job for, you know, our clients, for our community for the people that uh, reach out to us and, you know, want to work with us. And so that's definitely my focus for the years to come. Amazing. Thanks. You thanks know, a lot, like, Jan. What am I going to be doing next? I'm not even thinking about it, but yeah, you know, definitely not thinking about anything else right now. Just, you know, focusing on the good work. Of course, of course. Now, thanks a lot, Jan. Uh, that was amazing. And, you know, from all of us at Middlesex University, product design, product design, engineering, design engineering, you know, we're really grateful for you joining us all the way from China, eight hours ahead. And if you were ever to come to the UK, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll be more than happy to host you on campus as well, show you around. And yeah, it was cool. thanks a lot. It's, it's, been, it's been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, and, and everyone who, who put this together. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you.